Let us pray. Our Father, we thank you for this time. We bless your name because of all that you have been teaching us since we came on Wednesday night. Lord, your will be done. Not our will, not our way, not what we decide or what we desire. Father, our prayer is that from now on, every step of the way, your will be done in Jesus' name. As it pleases you, guide us and lead us. Father, we pray that as we end up this workers' retreat, all that we have learned will be impressed and inscribed upon every heart by the Spirit of the living God in Jesus' name. Lead us on. In Jesus' name we pray. First Kings chapter 18 First Kings chapter 18 from verse 21 to verse 23 we read to verse 24 And Elijah came unto all the people and said how long all she between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. And the people answered him not a word. Then said Elijah unto the people, I, even I only, remain a prophet of the Lord. But Baal's prophets a four hundred and fifty men. Let them therefore give us two bullocks, and let them choose one bullock for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on wood, and put no fire under, and I will dress the other bullock, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire under. And call ye on the name of your gods. And I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God that answereth by fire, let him be God. And all the people answered and said, It is well spoken. As Christian workers and those who are familiar with the Bible, the story I've read to you, it's not completely strange to you. What may be strange to you or new to you is the time or the period in the church where we need an Elijah today that will challenge Christendom and all the nations of the world to, to understand or to make us to know the kind of God that still can answer by fire. About three and a half years had passed for the children of Israel, they neither heard the voice of God or the voice of the prophet of God, Elijah. The nation had gone into what the Lord did not expect them to go into. They had backsliding. And the reason for their backsliding is not far-fetched. Their king, Ahab, had gone into the foreign land and had brought in everything foreign. And whatever those things were, they made the children of Israel to become foreign or strangers to their God. One, he brought in Jezebel, a foreigner. And when Jezebel came into Israel, she brought in all the things that she knew. The things that were normal with pagans and with heathens, she brought in to the people of Israel. And then the customs and the systems and the dressing and the worship and the attitude of all the foreigners she brought in by and by the heart of Ahab became foreign to the God of Israel. That is, his heart went away from the Lord. By and by, the leaders of Israel also had the same problem. 
their hearts became foreign or strange to God. And God and the word of God became foreign or strange unto them. Before a long time, they started worshipping Baal. And Baal, incidentally, was supposed to be a god of fire. Symbol without reality. Picture without the genuine thing. And the children of Israel went astray. And because of this, God himself dealt with that nation. And as three and a half years had passed, Elijah came now to the people and he asked them a question that we should be asking the church today. We should be asking Christendom and the nations of the world today, how halt ye between two opinions? Why are you standing between two opinions? That means Elijah was saying, as a nation, a nation that was got out of the land of Egypt by the mighty power of God and the mighty hand of God, where do you stand? A nation that all other nations feared when they heard about the God of Israel. A nation that knew God and saw God. A nation that came out of Egypt in great power with the manifestation of the glory of God. Elijah was asking them, whom do you believe now? Where do you stand now? Are you still with the God of Israel? Or as a woman, Jezebel, turned the heart of your king, the heart of the leaders, and the hearts of all the children of Israel, as a woman coming from the foreign land, add more effect and add more impact on this whole nation than the prophets of God who had been teaching them the word of God for such a long time? Well, in any case, they couldn't answer. And when Elijah said, how long? Three and a half years have passed. How long will you hold between two opinions? If God be God, follow him. If Baal, then follow him. Now we need to ask you the same question too. Here we are at the workers' retreat. There may be people that were here at the last workers' retreat, and they are not here now. Maybe they didn't answer a question like this at that time. They didn't know where they were standing. And they didn't make up their minds that come what may, rain or storm. Because a lot of rain will fall as the end is coming to a close. A lot of storms will blow. A lot of wind will blow. As this generation is coming to an end. This is that generation that Jesus spoke about. This generation. Seeing all these things will not pass until all the rest of the things be fulfilled. And before this thing comes to an end, a lot of wind will blow, a lot of storm, a lot of rain, and a lot of flood will descend. But then, these people that came to the workers' retreat the last time, and they are not here today, maybe they didn't think about this question, how long, how she, between two opinions. I'm sure that in your own location, in your own church, in your own locality, you would have seen people that were working with the Lord, they were following the Lord, they were reading the Bible, they were attending our fellowships and meetings, they were participating in retreats with us. I'm sure you know some of them now, the wind of this last day has blown them away. They were, they were you know, lingering a little bit, they were going outside the camp, and then they were coming to the midst of the children of Israel, then they go outside the camp again and come into the children, the midst of the children of Israel. We didn't really know where they were standing. They were bringing in Jezebel ideas, Jezebel dressing, Jezebel philosophy, Jezebel ideology, until eventually the Bible became foreign to them and they couldn't stand. And the question they needed to have addressed is, how long? How she between two opinions? If this God be God, let's follow him. If the one that created heaven and earth, if the one that defeated and destroyed Pharaoh and all his army, if the one that stopped all that Balaam and Balak were planning, if the one that defeated Og and Bashan, if he's still God, if the one that rained manna out of heaven for 40 years, 
every day of those 40 years, if it's God, if the one that dried up the Red Sea before you, you children of Israel, if he be God, then follow him. If the one that made the Jericho walls to fall down, if he's that same God, the eternal one, the one that says, I am that I am, and he never changes, if he's still God, if he's still the master of angels and men, if he's still the controller and the planner of all the events of the world, if he's still the one that is and was and will ever be, children of Israel, follow him. But if Baal, the God of the Philistines, the one that has eyes he cannot see, ears he cannot hear, legs but he cannot walk, if that is the God you now believe, follow him. And the people answered him not a word. When he saw that he didn't answer any word, he said, all right, we'll give a test. Baal is supposed to be a god of fire. Let us see if he can stand up to his name. Because the mighty God can stand up to his name. He's the king of glory. He stands to that name. He's the holy God. He stands to that name. He's the god of fire and judgment. He stands to that name. He's the supernatural God. He stands to that name. And he's the eternal one. He stands to that name. He's the great I am that I am. He stands to that name. He's the one that says I am God and there is none else you can compare with me. He stands to that name. He's the majestic God and he's the high God. He stands to that name. Now let us see if your own God that you have chosen in the middle of the way can stand to his name. Being a God of fire, let all his prophets come out and bring fire from him. Oh, and the people now said, you said well. If there is anything we need in the church today, it is the publication or the declaration or the propagation of the, church, the God that stands to his name. And I dare tell you, is the God of fire. Now, if he's the God of fire, there should be the Spirit's flame in the church. And you see what, where we are today, where the church is today. The church needs to recover the fire of the Holy Ghost in the church. Now when we talk about the God of fire, and we talk about the flame of the Spirit in the church, now that, uh, fl that flame in the midst of the children of Israel came upon altars of wood. But you know, we are now the sacrifice. We are now the people that are laid upon the altar. The sacrifice is no more goat or sheep or dove. The sacrifice is no more an animal or a bird. But you and the one that is now to consecrate your life and lay yourself upon the altar. And when we talk about fire coming upon the altar of God, we're really talking the New Testament language of fire coming upon your life. Now when the fire falls today, we don't see it on wood. We don't see it on animal. We see it on the people that proclaim the name of the Lord. And there's another thing we need. We need the fire in the church. The spirit's flame. In John chapter 5. John chapter 5. Verse 35. He was a burning and a shining light. And ye were willing for a season to rejoice in his light. I want you to concentrate on the first uh, part of that verse. He was a burning and a shining light. How I pray that the time will come in our own church here. We don't know about the, about the worldwide church. We do not know about the worldwide denominations. We do not know about the other people that are naming the name of Christ. All we can say is about this small group, about these people that are gathered here today, how I pray that the time will come that nobody will step on the pulpit of deeper life if it's not a burning and a shining light. You see, we have a lot of people that are religious pretenders. A lot of people that do not have the real fire, the fire of heaven upon their soul. We have a lot of people that can preach like Balaam's ass. We have a lot of people that can control and lead and counsel like Balaam's ass. We have a lot of people, no fire in the soul. There is no conviction. There is nothing burning within them. But think about John the Baptist. That was a burning and a shining light. And remember, he didn't say that about himself. Neither did any of his disciples say that about him. 
Neither did any of the kings or the leaders of the nation at that time say that about him. It was Jesus Christ himself. And whenever Jesus gives a testimony about an individual, that testimony must be right. There was nothing that Jesus could say about that man except this, that that man, John the Baptist, he was a burning and a shining light. And uh, you know that, you know that the testimony is true. Whenever John the Baptist spoke to Herod, he couldn't laugh. He couldn't smile. It was a burning light. It was a burning fire inside Herod. And think about Herodiah. Whenever John the Baptist spoke about their relationship, he spoke about it. They knew that that was fire. He represented the God of fire. Whenever he spoke to the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the scribes, and he said, ye generation of vipers, now you know that is a preacher with fire. Because, you know, a psychedelic preacher, a person that is not really there, not here, a person who doesn't want to offend anybody, a person who is like a jellyfish, a person with no backbone, no conviction, a person that has no doctrinal stand, a person that has not turned his back to the world, a person that is not only seeking, not seeking the glory of God alone in everything he says and everything he preaches. He is not going to talk to people and say, ye generation of vipers who has wanted to flee from judgment to come, behold, the axe is laid to every tree, at the root of every tree, and every tree that does not bring forth good fruit is cut down, him down, and is cast into the fire. And seek not to say within yourselves, we have Abraham for our father. Now you know that a jellyfish preacher can never talk like that. A person that is currying favor, looking for favor from all the sinners, or looking for money, or looking for their tithe. You know he can never talk like that. But then he told them that you do not think that you are children of Abraham, but that out of these Gentile stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. Now, it was a burning light. And now I pray that deeper light pulpits will be filled with people like this. People who will burn conviction in the hearts of the people that are listening to them. That in every house fellowship, in every area, in every zone or district, the people that will stand for the word of God and they will be burning and shining light. Now, what makes a person to be burning and shining like that? What makes a person to speak with great conviction, arresting conviction in the hearts and the lives of the people? Jeremiah chapter 20 and in verse 9. Jeremiah chapter 20, verse 9. Then said I, I will not make mention of him, nor speak any more in his name. Now don't misunderstand Jeremiah. Jeremiah was not a backslider. Jeremiah was not a person that was going to compromise. Jeremiah was not planning to go into the world. Jeremiah was not planning to go to business. Jeremiah was not planning to do any other thing. What Jeremiah was saying is this. He said he had spoken the word of God to, uh, to Jerusalem and Judah. He had spoken the word of God to the kings and all the elders and all the people of Jerusalem and Judah. He had spoken the word of God to the whole nation. Not only that, his prophecies had not only taught Judah and Jerusalem and Israel. His prophecies had taught Babylon, Assyria, and all other places. His uh, prophecies had not only taught the people of his own generation, of his own time. His prophecies had gone beyond thousands of years, even to the time of the great tribulation. But the children of Israel were not obeying the word of the Lord. They were not repenting. They were not doing what they ought to do. And so Jeremiah said, I will just keep quiet and be in fellowship with my God. That if the whole nation will not worship God, I will worship the Almighty God. When he said, I will not make mention of his name, he didn't say, I will not be a preacher anymore. And therefore, I will just go into selling fish or selling crayfish or selling grand north, I will go into, you know, bringing something from the north and bringing it to the south. I'll go into the business of going to Abba, going to Nietzsche. I'm not going to preach anymore. No, that's not Jeremiah. If you know Jeremiah very well, Jeremiah could not be like that. What, it, what he meant is that if the people of Israel were not listening, 
he will just remain with his God. And what all the glory, all the worship, all the honor that the whole nation should have given to God, he will sit down in his corner and he will give everything to God. But then he said in that verse 9, but his word was in my heart. You know, it wasn't business in his heart when he said, I will not make mention of his name anymore to these people. I will not preach to these people anymore. He said, the word of the Lord was in my heart. You can see this man was not a backslider. It's different from, you know, the people today that say, well, I will not preach anymore because, you know, I've been having house fellowship and leading house fellowship and now I have no job and the church did not give me 500 naira to go and do business. I've been an area leader in this church now for how many years? For five years. And the church did not even wake up one day and say they are going to take one of my children and send him to school. I've been, uh, you know, uh, leading evangelism teams and doing a lot of things. I've been participating in retreats all this time. And the church has never even one day said, ah, brother or sister, this is a pair of shoes for you. Therefore, I don't think I will preach anymore. Not Jeremiah. Not that one. What you find today is many people that will say, you know, all these years that I've been doing this and doing this and doing that, this church, one day, they didn't hire the child. They didn't even come and do the naming ceremony for me. And while doing the naming ceremony, they will say, this is a gift from the church. I understand when the, I had a brother so-and-so send a gift to me, and uh, you, know, you know what he sent to me? He sent Bible to me. I have enough Bible. All these uh, church people, they never think about any other thing. I even thought that as I was having my wedding, having my naming ceremony, that they will buy crates of uh, minerals. And even the church, you think about it, I'm a zonal leader. And as a zonal leader, I was getting married. And this pastor and all this church, they know that uh, I've been, you know, laboring and having house fellowship and supervising and going all around. You know, as I was just having the, uh, uh, the marriage, you know all that the pastor said? Pastor just called me and said, don't make any mistake. Uh, that's holiness. That's all they're going to do. Don't make any mistake. Don't let them see any bad thing in your marriage. I said, yes, sir. You know, I'm, uh, you know, zonal leader. By the grace of God, everything I do will be a glory to the church. I thought that, uh, you know, he will say something more than that. He just said, I will, I'm praying for you. Uh, you can trust in my prayer. His prayer we will eat. All the, uh, all the other people, I know what they did for them in that other church. Even Sele, ordinary Sele, you know what they did when uh, one of their people, when they were getting married. Even Baptist, down there in our yard, in our village. When that man was going to get married, I know how the, you know, pastor's wife and all the people were bringing minerals and drink and everything and uh, kai kai and, you know, all this ogogoro uh, to them. Even if our church will not give me kai kai and all this uh, whiskey and shinab, I, at least they can buy minerals for me or buy maltex for me. Only prayer. I will not do our fellowship in this place again. Because you, zonal leader, zonal leader, they call us for this one, they call us for... We are the people making the church to grow. And when I wanted to marry, they never give me fadding. Only prayer, only holiness. And don't make any mistake. Uh, make sure that you watch that thing you are doing. I will not preach anymore. And uh, you say, I'm like Jeremiah. Uh -uh, Jeremiah was not like that. What Jeremiah meant is that because these people were not obeying the word of God, and because these people will not accept the truth of the doctrine of the word of God. He said, I will not make mention of his name to these backsliding people. Then he said, his word, his word was in my heart as a burning fire. Shut up in my bones. And I was weary with forbearing and I could not stay. You see that? The word was really stirring him up, burning him within him. When you are a real child of God and you, you serve the God of fire and you believe in the word of God, you see that word of God, it will be fire within you. And Jeremiah said, I could not stay. I could not contain. And then when he began to speak, the word he spoke, burnt in their heart, very seriously. I read to you on the first day how his prophecy was read out and the king couldn't stand it. And the king had to take a pen knife out, tear everything into pieces, threw it into the fire. If you read that chapter very well, and if you read uh, on, you will find that God told Jeremiah and said, you go and write that same thing. And he took Baruch, that is his secretary, and he wrote everything. And he said, send it to those nations again. Lamentations and woe and judgment and affliction. That these people that are not following after the Lord, these are the things that will come upon them. 
You see, Jeremiah, he was a prophet of fire. And now I pray that God will make you a prophet of fire. That the word of God will burn within you. And when you speak that word, it will have a burning effect on the hearts of the people that are hearing. In Luke chapter 24, Luke chapter 24, verse 32. And they said one to another, Did not our heart burn within us while he talked with us by the way? And while he opened to us the scriptures? You see that there are people today that specialize in being funny. They are clowns. And while they are preaching or they are giving out the word of God, it doesn't make sinners uncomfortable. It doesn't make backsliders uncomfortable. It doesn't stir anybody up. People can be committing adultery and fornication and be coming to that church for years. It never touches them. It never embarrasses them. And people can go into an equal yoke and they can come into the church. What they hear, all the things, the motivation and the mobilization and all the, all the gems and all the things they are giving out and all that they are reading and all the interpretation and all the application and all the preaching and all the statements, everything they say, it never convicts anybody. And the people can go on, they can go into the things of the world, they can go to the business of the world, they can go to the practices of the world, they can go to marry like the world, and the word they are hearing in that church never touches anybody. But when Jesus was speaking to these two people, and it doesn't matter whether your congregation is 2 or 20, it doesn't matter whether your congregation is 20 or 200. When you speak the word of God to those two people, to those 20 people or 200 people, it says, did not our heart burn within us? And were we not so much affected? Was there not so much deep conviction while he talked with us by the way? It is not building like this that makes your message convicting. It is not loudspeaker like this that makes your message convicting. It is not a fine pulpit, a fine pew that makes your message convicting. It is not the painting of the church building or the building of the church building that makes your church convicting. It is not the fan. It is not the air conditioner. It is not the pipe organ. It is not the orchestra. It is not the choir. You see, the two of them were going by the way. There was no pulpit. There was no pew. There was no loudspeaker, there was no organ, there was no choir, there was nobody, there was no prayer warrior to come and pray for the people 30 minutes before you come and preach. Hey, my message is not effective because you prayer warriors, you are not praying for me, that's an excuse. My message is not convicting because all you members of the choir, I don't know about your singing, you are not singing well, that's an excuse. My message is not convicting because all the loudspeaker is not working well, that's an excuse. There was no loudspeaker and there was nothing at all. And when you go to the house fellowship, hey, my message is not convicting. And the people are not really getting everything because, you know, they are very small. And they're just about 12 or they're just about 5. These were two people. And Jesus went into the world from Moses even unto the prophets and all the Psalms. And he said, did not our heart burn within us? While he talked with us by the way. And it is not even because they are sitting down. Some people say, you know, in the north where we are, there is no building. We don't even have bench. And the church at the capital, maybe the church, uh, you know, from the major city, they didn't send money to us so we can buy something. And, you know, whenever we come uh, to uh, where we are meeting, it's just under a particular tree. And there is no bench and there's nothing to sit on. And the people just stand up. They were walking by the way. It is not whether they are pews or not. It is not whether they are furniture or not. It is what is inside you. It is not what is outside the pew and all the benches and all the things. Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked with us by the way, while he opened to us, opened to us, opened to us. The scriptures, you find a lot of people today uh, they are preaching, and they want to show us what knowledge they have. And by the time they go into the Greek, and the Hebrew, and the concordance, and the dictionary, and the meaning, and the context, and the way it was used before, the way it was used after, the way it was first used, the people that first had the word, then the application and everything, you know the knowledge is there, but there is no fire on the wood. Just a lot of material. 
just a lot of wood, just a lot of things. You can tell this man has gone much into the forest of seminary. He has gone much into the forest of all the colleges. He has gone much into the forest of library. And he has brought out a lot of material. And a lot of material of what use is the wood without fire. And after all the interpretation, and after all the application, the thing does not burn in your heart. But you know, Jesus Christ, as he brought out the word of God from Moses and the prophets and all the writing, it says, did not our heart burn within us? Within us. Now, when these people had the word of God, now Jesus Christ was risen from the dead. And if Jesus had miracles to talk about, this was the greatest miracle. If Jesus wanted to tell stories, there was a great story to tell. How all the angels of heaven were watching, and how the stone was rolled away, and how all the soldiers, how they fell down flat, and how all the people were surprised, how he rose from the dead. There were a lot of stories to tell, but not Jesus. He went back to the Bible. What do you think about this? That Jesus Christ risen, glorified. And as he got away from the grave, and these people were going on the way to Emmaus, instead of telling them stories, instead of sharing testimony, instead of telling them how the stone was rolled away, instead of telling them how those soldiers, how they fell down, instead of telling them supernatural, secret things, mysterious things that happened in heaven. When he came and he, was, he rose from the dead, and when he went to visit the Father, after rising from the dead, instead of all those stories, he opened the scriptures unto them. This deeper life church is not for sharing revelation, dream, mystery, supernatural things. I had a dream. Put it in your pocket. Tell us about salvation. Tell us about without holiness no man shall see the Lord. Tell us blessed are the pure in heart. Only they shall see the Lord. Tell us how a man can leave the world of sin and come out clean and live a beautiful, holy life. That's what we want to hear. You see, Jesus Christ, he didn't tell you about all those mysteries and all those miracles and all those things. He came to them, he shared with them the very word of God. He never went into, if, if there was anybody that should know how to use apocrypha, how to deviate from the Genesis, Exodus, the Physicus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, and all the other books of the Old Testament that you have in your Bible, if there was anybody that had a right to deviate, if there was anybody that can go to a secret book somewhere, if there was anybody that could go to a secret writing somewhere that will convince these people, I think Jesus had the authority, but never. Before he died, he always appealed to the word of God. It is written. It is written. Again, it is written. And now he rose from the dead. And now you will think that after he had risen from the dead, he will have the liberty. And he will be able to appeal to, you know, uh, the other writing of Jesus, the other writing of uh, this one, the other writing of this one, the other, the forgotten writing, and forgotten this, and forgotten that. But no, he went back to the book of Moses. That is Genesis to Deuteronomy. And he went to all the prophets and in the Psalms and he interpreted and opened scripture unto them. You see, that is what we need today. And when he gave them the word of God, they said their hearts burned within them. And that is what we are praying for today. That God will make you a flame of fire. That when you preach the word of God as you are going back, the people that have been living in sin, their hearts will trouble them. Their hearts will convict them. And by the conviction of the Spirit upon them, they will rush and come in in Jesus' name. But look at Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews rather chapter 1. Verse 7. And of the angels he saith, who maketh his angels spirits? And his ministers a flame of fire. He maketh his ministers a flame of fire. And you see, this is it's only God that can do this. You cannot do this by learning a language. You cannot do this by copying another person. You cannot do this by pretending and trying to speak in a particular way. You cannot pretend to bring fire. Because, you know, Elijah spoke to all the people, 420 and uh, 450 prophets of Baal. He said, I give you all the time you need. Bring fire down. And if the real fire is not within you, if the fire of heaven has not dropped within your soul, 
we can give you all the time you need. And you cannot bring the fire down. It's God only who can do it. He maketh his ministers a flame of fire. But how does he do that? Because it says, he, the almighty God, he maketh those ministers flame of fire. The way he does it is very clear and plain in the scripture. In Isaiah chapter 6, verse 7. And then flew one of the seraphims unto me with a live coal in his hand, which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. And he laid it upon my leaves and said, Lo, this has touched thy leaves, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin is purged. This is the time we refer to in the life of Isaiah as when he had a purging experience. This is the time we refer to in the life of Isaiah as when he had a burning experience. When he had what we call a sanctification experience. Understand, from the very first chapter, Isaiah knew about salvation. He knew about reconciliation with God. He knew about forgiveness and peace with God. Was he not the one that told the whole nation, Come now, let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. And though they be red like crimson, they shall be white as wool. He knew about forgiveness. He knew about reconciliation. He knew about how the sins will be taken away completely. And how your life will become a changed life. If any man be in Christ, is a new creature. All things are passed away. All things are become new. He expressed it by saying you'll be as white as snow. As white as wool. But now, here is another thing. He saw the glory of the Lord. And his train filled the temple. And he saw the angels of God. And those angels, they never cried or shouted anything. But holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. The whole earth is full of his glory. And as Isaiah had all this, even though he had been reconciled with God, even though he knew about forgiveness and the peace of God, yet he began to see the depravity, the iniquity, the original sin, the carnality within him. He couldn't laugh. He couldn't smile. He couldn't have fellowship with those holy angels. He said, woe is me. I never knew that. I thought I was a fine preacher. I thought that I was doing well. I thought God had raised me up for a great ministry. But now I see another thing. I've been seeing the sinning Israelites. I've been seeing that from head to toe, everything is polluted. But now I see beyond Israel. I see within my own self. I am undone because I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king, the Lord of hosts, then flew, then flew, then flew. Not that he walked. You see, cleansing and purging is urgent. Not that he was, you know, walking leisurely unto Isaiah. The cleansing from sin. The purging that we're talking about. The refining we're talking about. The fire coming upon your soul. Upon your heart. It's an urgent thing. Then flew one of the seraphims unto me having a live coal in his hand. Which he had taken with the tongues from off the altar. From off the altar of the Lord. He laid it upon my mouth. And said, Lo, Isaiah, this has touched thy lips. Thine iniquity is taken away. Thy sin, singular, is the original sin. Is the nature of sin. Is the root of sin. Is the inward thing that had been there. That the people didn't see. That only the searchlight of God can search it out. Thy sin is purged. And as he was told this, then the call of the Lord came afresh to him. Some people, they only have one call to talk about. You know, I said they called before, long ago, I said they called. And because they had the call, they had been talking to the nation of Israel. From the very first chap chapter and from the very first uh, I, um, verse, it said, the vision of Isaiah. Oh yes, he had, been he had been having revelation and vision. He had had the call of the Lord, but this was another thing. After that, a new call, a fresh call came upon him, 
since when did you receive a fresh anointing, a fresh calling, a fresh uh, inspiration from the Lord that says, now I'm choosing you and I'm sending you. Oh, God called me 30 years ago. That's where you're still sitting. God called me 20 years ago. There you are. We're talking about something fresh. When the fire of God has come afresh upon your soul, upon your spirit, upon your nature. You know, when fire comes, it burns away every refuse. What do you do? When you, after you have brought all this uh, paper, now the paper is not poisonous, but it litters the ground. After you have brought all the wood, now the wood may not be poisonous, but you know, it litters the ground. And you bring all the things together and you burn everything. Don't you know there's a lot of refuse even in your life? Yes, I know you are born again. A lot of refuse. A lot of things that the Almighty will look at and say, why are all these things occupying your life? The sheet of paper there, the idea there, the friendship there, the interaction there, the things, the tendency, you know, to have friends in the world there, and all these, uh, you know, unserious attitude in your life, and this, don't you know there's a lot of refuse in your life, and you go to the Lord after your eyes have seen the glory of the coming King. And then he brings the fire and he burns everything up. That's what we're talking about. Then in Malachi chapter 3. Malachi chapter 3. I'm talking about how he makes you a flame of fire. When this real sanctification experience has come upon you and the fire has burnt every refuse within you. Look at Malachi chapter 3 verse 3. And he shall see it as a refiner and purifier of silver. And he shall purify the sons of Levi and purge them as gold and silver that they may offer unto the Lord an offering in righteousness. There are a lot of people that have missed out this. And you know, you see it, uh, you know, every time. You find that uh, maybe one day, the house fellowship leader rose up and he spoke what's on his heart. Fiery, purging, convicting, burning. You find some people that was, oh, I can't go to that house fellowship again. I will go to the other house fellowship. After all, the, the other house fellowship is also near my house. I prefer to go to that one. You know, they are running away from the refining fire of the Spirit of God. Or it may be that you find that husband and wife, they have been having quiet time together. And the uh, husband has, you know, all the time been, you know, laughing and smiling and being friendly, having fellowship and being nice. And even if uh, he sees anything that the wife is new, which ought to be corrected by the word of God, the husband will not like to bring it out at that time. He will just want the quiet time or the family devotion to go on just steadily like that. And things have been going on. And if uh, the husband, uh, you know, sees anything that uh, my wife... Uh, you know, you are not praying enough, or this is not okay, and that is not okay. The husband may be controlling himself and saying, Oh Lord, speak to her. And I do not want to stir up anything. I do not want to disturb anybody. I do not want to use family quiet time, you know, to bring out all these things. And the wife will say, Ah, my husband, our quiet time, our family devotion. But one day, the Spirit of God came down upon that husband. And the Spirit of God turned him to another man. And when they were having the family devotion quiet time, something was coming out of his mouth that he never planned before. He never thought he would speak like that before, but it was like burning fire. And, uh, you know, after the prayer that day, the wife would say, <laughs> if this is how family devotion will go, I think that uh, we have to be having it separately now. And the second day, the husband, uh, not knowing that the wife is fighting with the Spirit of God, not knowing that the wife is now turning away from the message that has come from heaven. The husband said, my wife, how about it now? Quiet and, ah, uh, my husband, the one of yesterday I have not recovered. Uh, you can have your own. I, you, uh, at least, uh, before I married you, I have been a Christian. And the Bible is not strange to me. I know the spirit of God. And I know the word of God. And uh, we have been, you know, going to workers retreat together. So, uh, go and have your own. I want God to talk to me today. I don't want any disturbance anymore. You don't want quiet time again. You know why? Because the refining fire of God came through the husband and God wanted to purge that wife. But no, they don't want purging. Or it may be that they come to our church and, you know, the pastor has been nice 
and as being a normal, regular pastor, he has compassion, he has love, he has mercy. He's tender towards everybody, and he doesn't like to stir anything up. But this day, God just came down in a mighty way. And, uh, you know, while the uh, preacher was uh, talking, the pastor, he mentioned some things he gave, it, illustrations he never wrote down, illustrations he never heard from anybody, illustrations that nobody ever came to report to him. And while the, you know, pastor is preaching, it may be in a local government, maybe in a state capital, uh, you know, he said something very touching, that the Spirit of God just pinpointed, it was right on the, on the dot. And the hammer was striking the nail. And, uh, you know, you will find these people that will say, ah, <laughs> this is the kind of preaching that we're going to be having now. Uh, when I came to the church, all I saw was, you know, all this variety night and the eating of biscuit and, you know, drinking of a uh, Fanta and all this, uh, you know, good, good meeting that we used to have. And, you know, we go to a uh, hotel somewhere, we bring all these nice people together, all these neat people, well-dressed people together. We give them good music and we smile. We say, God will bless you. Jesus will never leave you. There's a miracle for you every day. And that's why I came to the church. And since I came to the church, the people have been very nice. The ushers will smile. The choir will play, you know, a very good piece. And the pastor, and I love that pastor, you know, he will come, he will say, you know, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. God will bless you. He will read the word of God. Whenever he reads the word of God, it will be like cold water on somebody who has been feeling dry. It will be like a refreshing water. But no, he has changed now. He just came from Lagos and he preached one message and all my adultery is what he's talking about. And, you know, the second wife and everything. <laughs> if it is going to be like this, I don't know what I will do. In fact, they have been calling me in the assemblies of God to come and be the Sunday school superintendent there. They have been calling me in the first squad to come and do this. And they have been calling me in the Anglican church to come and be the lay reader. They have been calling me. I think I will, I will think of what to do because this kind of message, I don't know why they are preaching like this. Now maybe they have gone to report me to the state overseer. And I'm, <laughs> I don't think I will stand this one. You cannot stand heaven. Because you know if you are going to get to heaven, it's going to take the refining fire. You cannot go to heaven in your native, in your native heart. You cannot go to heaven the way you were born, with all the depravity, with all the refuse, and all the dirt upon your life. It's going to take fire, refining fire, coming from heaven upon the pulpit, upon the preacher, upon the people, upon the people to come upon you and refine you and change you. And it is when you say, oh Lord, knock me. Oh Lord, strike me. Oh Lord, send the fire. Let it burn. And I don't care from where it is burning, from the study scripture teacher or from the house fellowship leader or from the state overseer or from the pastor or from the preacher. Lord, let it burn. Everything that needs to be burnt out of my life, let it burn. And I want it to burn so that I'll be able to make heaven. That's the only condition by which you can make heaven. And I pray that you will endure. You know, I told you that in this, at this world is running to an end. The, the message that can change people, the message that will lead people into the kingdom of God, will not be the kind of message that you have been hearing, smile, Jesus loves you, will not be the kind of message you have been, that brings no conviction, no burning effect on any heart. Let's look at Jeremiah chapter 23. Jeremiah chapter 23, from verse 29. It says, it's not my word, like as a fire, says the Lord, and like a hammer that breaketh the rock in pieces. Some people do not know how to evaluate the word of God, how to evaluate the preaching they are hearing. Maybe they, you know, somebody comes to your stage, and, uh, you know, they are preaching somewhere, and then you go there, ah, uh, you say, hey. so this is how they are preaching in this other place. Very nice preaching, very cool preaching, very soothing, comforting preaching. This is the kind of preaching we need. And when we go to our own deeper life church, come and see our preacher, come and see our pastor, and see how they preach. They bring fire down. You know, God himself tells you, the one that he associates with. He said, it's not my word, like as a fire. The other one you are hearing over there, that will never touch the heart of polygamists. 
that will never touch the heart of the people that are living wrong, that will never touch the hearts of the people that are hypocritical. That one is not of God. But you know, there are a lot of people, they think they are set in the church to judge our pastors and our leaders. And whenever they come to the church, after they have heard the word, it may be in your state capital church, or it may be in your district, or it may be in your, in your village church. After you get out of the church, uh, the first thing you will ask uh, the other fellow is, how was the preaching today? Well, I pray that's not what I mean. I mean this, our state overseer. How did you see the preaching today? That thing that they preached. Well, I, I prayed. I just thought that they are preaching the word of God. Uh, you are not sharp. They are after brother so and so. Oh, is that so? Ah, you don't know? That man, I can detect. Anytime he preaches, when, he, when he's after sister so and so, last week, it was sister so and so. Today, this Sunday now, is brother so and so. Anytime they preach, if you don't know who they are coming, talking about, come to me. I will tell you. That's what they are doing now. They will put the message on this man, on that man. They cannot tell. They do not know how the Lord acts. They do not know the word of the Lord. God said, my word is like fire and it burns. And it is when you allow the word of God to burn you. And you know, everybody runs away from fire. Even our little children, they run away from fire. Even the, you know, the women, they run away from fire. And even men, they run away from fire. And that's why people run away. When the word of God comes, it takes only the person that wants to get to heaven. You know, Isaac never ran away from the fire. When his father, we are your parents in the Lord, this state of us and myself, we are your parents in the Lord. If we know that you need to be stretched upon the altar, we stretch you upon the altar. If we know that you have the sword of the Spirit that will cut you and pierce you, we bring the sword of the Spirit. If we know that you need fire to come upon your soul and your spirit and make you born for the Lord, we bring the fire of the word of God on you. And you know, I seek in you, that's my father Abraham. Let him bring the sword. Let him bring the fire. He's my father. He knows what he's doing. But you know, people are not like that today. They don't believe that we love them. They don't believe that we are their father. It's only when we talk about bread and butter, they know at that time we are their parents in the Lord. When we are talking about God will provide wife for you this month, before this month runs out, God is going to provide a wife, a husband for you. That's my father in the Lord. But when it says the soul that sinneth, it shall die. It's not my father in the Lord. I got converted in Lagos before I came to Quara State. So it's not my father and the Lord. My father and the Lord is in Lagos because the preacher preached and said, the soul that sinneth, it shall die. So it's no more my father and the Lord. But I seek me his father. Do you know your father? Do you know the word of God? When that fire is coming and it's burning, you say, oh Lord, I need it. Don't you need the fire of the Lord to drop in your soul, to drop in your mind? Burn every refuse and burn everything that is evil away from your life. And you see, when that fire of the Lord is there, you will not allow it to be there alone only for one day, only for two weeks. It will be there all the time. In Exodus chapter 40. Exodus chapter 40, verse 38. For the cloud of the Lord was upon the tabernacle by day, and the fire was on it by night. In the sight of all the house of Israel throughout, throughout all their journeys, how I pray that the fire of God will never die out of this church. The fire of God will never die out of our pulpit. That God will set every preacher, every minister on fire and that the fire of God will burn in Jesus' name. The God that answers by fire. That's the God we're going to serve. And the children of Israel said, That was well said. And all the 450 prophets of Baal, they did everything they wanted to do. And after doing all those things, no fire came down. Then Elijah came and he repaired the altar of the Lord. And then he laid the sacrifice on the altar. And he poured water therein. And after he repaired everything, he said, God, convince these people that have done everything according to your word. That's it. And the fire fell down. Before the fire can come upon your life, 
and you can be a burning and shining light before the people in your zones, in your district, in your local government, and in your city, and in your state, and in the whole of this nation. Repair the altar of the Lord. See what has been spoiled. See all the things that have gone uh, upside down. Repair everything by the word of the Lord. And make yourself, I told you, the sacrifice is no more goat and sheep and dove and turtle doves. You are now the person that will come upon the altar. And you say, Lord, here am I. There's no looking back. I place myself upon the altar of the Lord. Do with me as it pleases you. And the fire of God will come upon you. Once that fire of God comes, don't let that fire ever be put out. Let that fire remain there. And if that fire remains there, you will lead many people to the Lord. You see, the fire fell on the day of Pentecost. And Peter began to preach. And the conviction came on the hardened Jews. And they said, men and brethren, what shall we do to be saved? Rise up now on your feet. And you tell the Lord all that you have heard during this retreat. From all our state overseers and our preachers. All that you learned in the main messages and the seminars and the Bible study. All that you have heard and all that you have prayed about. Let the fire fall on everything. Let the fire fall on everything. And you be a bright shining light. And let the fire consume everything consumable. Every refuse every carelessness, every impurity, everything that is not according to the will of God, according to the word of God. Let the fire of God burn. Let it burn in your heart. Don't run away from the fire of God. Don't run away from a convicting message. Don't run away from the Spirit's application to your own shortcoming. Don't run away from the message God is sending to the church in your own locality. Let the fire keep on burning. Let the fire keep on burning. Let the fire keep on burning. If there is any foreign idea in your heart, if there is any foreign material in your home, if there is any foreign thought in your mind, let the fire burn it up. Let the fire burn. Let the fire burn. Don't shake up the conviction of the Spirit of God. Let the fire burn. Don't run away from convicting message from your husband, from your pastor, from your leader. 
Let the fire burn. Let it burn. It is not convenient, but let it burn. It's not going to be easy, but let it burn.